Railway Conversations with Doc Frank. Hello, this is Doc Frank. Welcome back to my podcast. My guest today is Sonny Kaur from Perth in Western Australia, same city where I live in. Sonny has collected over a number of years a vast project management experience, not just in Australia, but also in the USA and in Southern Europe. And all that time while managing to coordinate her own career with the career of her partner and husband. We talk about the importance of small actions in projects, a comparison of work cultures between Australia and the USA, the special relationships between project managers and project engineers, how to get projects back on track, the value of women on project teams, the Women in Technology Initiative, Davins Goggins, Cookie Jar, and much more. If you subscribe to this podcast, it will help the show greatly. So if you have subscribed already, thank you very much. If not, then please consider doing so. And also tell a friend about that who would enjoy this podcast as well. Remember, sharing is caring. Hi, it's Doc Frank again. What can I say? Even the best CBTC training in the world arguably can get even better. And that's what's happened with the brand new 2024 Understanding CBTC Fundamentals Training. This is an upgrade from the previous CBTC Kickstarter training that exists since 2014 and has been continuously refined, improved and updated. You have a massive 30 video lessons that you can watch on demand as long as you live. You've got lifelong access. You can build a certifiable CBTC competency and the certification is offered by me as well as an additional option. You do not need prior signaling knowledge for this training. Just imagine that you can learn the fundamentals of CBTC without needing to know anything about railway signaling before the training. So that really makes it suitable for anybody working in the railway industry and for anybody being interested in working in the railway industry. The training is topped up by an industry-leading Q&A support over at least 12 months. You can sign up for this fantastic training under docfranktraining.podia.com slash cbtc. I repeat that, docfranktraining.podia.com slash cbtc. And if you needed one additional argument, this course is actually cheaper than last year's training. So... That's my way of helping you fighting inflation. Hope you enjoy and I hope to see you at this CBTC training. Sonny, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Frank. How are you? Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for being on here again. We had some technical problems last week related to heat and this week it should be much better because I'm in a cooler place and I hope so are you. Um, you have... Yeah, yeah, but the heat is gone yet. Yes, yes, it's, it's a little bit better, but uh, I think it will come back anyway. So um, let's let's get to the topic. You are quite experienced in the field of project management and um, you have had work experience uh, both here in Australia and uh, overseas in America of, of all places, which I think it's a relatively rare combination. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some highlights of your career, please? Sure. Um, so I had the opportunity to move to the U.S. Um, Boston was the, the first project that we were moved to. Um, my husband actually got relocated with the organization that we were in. Um, and I formed part of the package, I'm going to say per se. So I was the project manager on a project for the uh, positive train control um, project back in Boston. Um, and the the highlights for me, I think... You know, obviously, we, we went in um, to the project when it was in a critical phase. Uh, there were 
um, significant amount of LDs that were imposed on the project. Um, and the, it was in a position where we we could make a difference. I think that was one of the reason why the opportunity sort of was appealing because it was one of those things that you want to go in and you want to change the situation and you want to sort of bring the project forward. So it was the kind of, it was the right kind of a project to be in. Um, and that was really what sort of drawn me uh, to, to, for the move to the, to the US. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, for the listeners that don't know, LD stands for liquidated damages. Uh, which yes. basically means you have to to pay money as a contractor if you don't perform properly. And uh, avoiding this is normally uh, very much in the commercial interest of the company of the supplier. So um, yeah, so so well well done for that. Um, maybe we stay with this a moment. If you can talk about it. So so what was it exactly where you found you had the the biggest impact that that even led to the avoidance of penalties in the project? So the phase that we were in, um, so when when we went into the project, it was mostly the construction was complete. Um, there was the last bit of construction that was being completed, per se. Uh, it was the commissioning phase that we were in, and a lot of the designs were still open. Um, the comments on the designs were still open. So that, that the drive of getting that sort of closed, so there was a lot of, close conversations within key stakeholders just to get things moving. I think that was the big um, impact that we could bring to the project rather than going into the, the non-ending review cycles. You know, we update the, the design, it gets in, and then it just stays there with the approving authority, comes back with comments. So I think just to sort of reduce or actually remove that sort of um, uh, dependency, on, on just submitting, getting something back, rather than sitting in a room, just getting together and just closing the key um, key comments. Um, and so what, what we ended up doing was, you know, putting in place a process where only Category 1 comments were, which were the critical safety-related comments, were closed first to move on to the next phase. And then we, re we sort of worked on the quality-related comments as a secondary item. Um, in that phase, we sort of got through the first phase of um, standalone testing, um, which which was really the first phase of the commissioning. Um, and whilst we were doing that, that give us, gave us enough time to sort of go through the quality related comments so that by the time we get into the third phase of testing, which was the integrated testing, you actually had a design that was reliable, a design that had addressed all the concerns, rather than trying to attack all the comments at the same time same time. So I think that sort of helped the project significantly. Um, the other big element to the project was the software development. And um, like all software development projects, I and mean, we had the same concerns here when I was working on, on, on the Western Australian project, where you have software that comes in, there are, there are, you know, thousands of requirements that needs to be addressed and you sort of go through, like, you know, there are drops. If you break them into smaller drops and have addressed um, functionalities that you want to want sort of break them out into the way you want to see them first, um, I thought that was another big one that helped um, incremental sort of releases that sort of you validate them, you move on, have the second software drop, you do the regression testing on the previous one and sort of move on in that way. I think that kind of helped a lot as well towards the towards the program. Um, again, they're the small they're the small bits, but they are bits that I think sort of were needed in the phase they were we were in. Um, we were in a phase that you needed a a very sort of you know, streamlined process, um, not that the process and the project didn't work, but I think it was at the phase of the project where we needed another, a, an intervention, really, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, yeah, sometimes uh, you don't see the forest for the trees when you are in the thick of things. And if somebody then comes in from the outside and gives a fresh view and comes up with a logical, often simple process to, to like, grease the wheels, to sort things out, 
um, and, and really brings something forward that's then appreciated by the client that gives a positive feedback to the supplier and then they do better work and so on. So it's, it's like a it's, it's like a vicious cycle, but positive. It, it's really an uphill cycle. I could imagine that some people of the established project team may have been a bit um, apprehensive of somebody coming in from the outside, even completely new to the country, and suddenly calling the shots or coming up with ideas how to do everything better. Did you experience anything like that or was everybody so desperate that they said, well, any, any good idea that helps is welcome? So I was kind of fortunate. Uh, my the project manager that was there in, in the U.S. Um, was the ex-project manager that I was working with back in, back in the U.S., so back in Australia, sorry. So he, I, we had a working history. Um, I think that sort of helped a lot because he knew where I could come in and help rather than just throwing me into the whole, you know, sort of like thick into all the, the whole process of the project. So he knew I could help in with the, the deployment aspect and he threw me in there, um, which was sort of good. Um, I think the, the initial concerns obviously was within the, on the client side, because again, you know, there were a lot of people that there was a lot of turnover within the project over over the years. Um, there was a lot of stress related within that phase of the project. So having a new person in, you always have to kind of prove yourself that, you know, what what do you bring to, uh, to the table, really? That's really where what it was. Um, again, not, not too much sort of didn't receive a lot of negativity on the, in that space. Um, it was a bit more like, okay, yeah, here we go. We have another person that's going to come in and so-called fix the situation and let's see where it goes. And, you know, I gave it about three months. I mean, normally three months is heaps um, coming into just really getting your head into where you are at. Um, and I was fortunate because I moved within the same organization. So I had understood the processes of the project and, you know, the from a QA perspective, from a PM perspective. So I, I didn't really have to learn a lot about the organization. It was sort of a trans, what a smooth transitional move. Um, so that was good. All I had to do was three months of learning the client. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. Sounds good. And then, as I said, it, it's, it's getting... Um, um, it's getting a positive feedback loop once they realize that you you are adding value and things are improving then uh, they appreciate that and then that that basically paves the way to to further improvements that that was that was quite good um so after you finished the project in in boston or your your role finished there you stayed in the us for for longer i think yes yes so um so with the so when the project with Boston, um, the one that I was there for was the uh, positive train control project. Um, once that element sort of got into revenue service, um, I moved uh, to California for the CBTC project, which was awarded um, to the organization during COVID. Actually, right right, thick of COVID is when I moved to to California where. Um, with within that role, then I still stick around for about three years uh, before moving back to Australia. That that's San Francisco, I reckon. That's the Bart project. Yes, the Bart project. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's quite a it's quite a big job, isn't it? So so what what phase was the project in while you were there? Uh, we were just awarded the contract at that point. So um, I I went in during the notice to proceed period, uh, right when the contract was awarded. Um, and, you know, we had the good part of the first quarters, first one or two quarters to put the safety management plans, the project management plans and all the plans to be approved. Um, I was working on the deployment side of works. Um, so where I was in charge of, getting the subcontractor, the, the construction subcontractor on board to get the surveys uh, completed. Um, and that was the first exercise that we had to do just to understand 
what state were the 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 the, the line was at and um, and yeah so that was my my first assignment um, on the project mainly getting the construction contract in place getting the guys mobilized um, getting the safety plans approved so those are the things that the very initial things that I was uh, working with and um, yeah it is it is a huge project it was a 10 years uh, it's 10 years project to to complete um, for, for that and uh, yeah huge so but now you're back in Australia what what made you come back so for for us it it's sort of yeah we would have still stayed i think um but so we had a visa visa situation um during covid there was a lot of uh, backlog in terms of getting visas to the us um getting the approved and all that so we, you normally get a five-year visa which is what we were on um when covid hit generally you'll get the visa renewed um to the in the first third year of of your five-year period uh, but that's right bang on when COVID was um, COVID was a thing, which is still a thing. Uh, but it was a huge thing then. Uh, we couldn't get out of the country to get the visas renewed. So the first opportunity we had um, was about not last year, year before, yeah, two years ago. Um, and again, it was one of those things where we were out of the country. We were working. Um, in the nights to support the project still because um, we were still working on the San Francisco project but we were in Italy um, so I had a six month um, six months sort of uh, working from home situation working from home from another country in another time zone and you know in the in the in the role that I was in the role that my husband was in because we worked for the same project um, it was quite challenging for us and for our family um, so that was one of the, those things that sort of said, you know, well, it's a, it, it is what it is. We do need to come back to a stable type situation. Um, that's when the opportunity in Australia came about. And, um, and yeah, I jumped on that and came back home. It's, it's probably a lucky coincidence or maybe a series of lucky coincidences that, that you, you oh, both God. were able to move together, that, that you both were able to work all the time. And um, it, it's, not, it's not often the case that an employer really manages the coordination between two partners, getting them on the same project, not just once, but repeatedly. You said it happened in Boston, it happened again in San Francisco, and then it happened again when you returned to Australia. And, and apparently in the meantime, you mentioned Italy, um, it, it probably also worked uh, like working from home. So it wasn't just you sitting in, in Italy, and we, I come to that in a second, how Italy of all the places. Um, I may have an idea, but but I'll let you explain. Um, and and your your partner basically having the same the same situation at the same at the same time. So so I, I must say the employer must have done um, pretty pretty well there, really putting effort into to keep you together and get both of you interesting work. Because often often enough, even if uh, if you manage to normally you get one person into a project that's what you normally want to do and if that person says okay well i i only come in a pair uh and my partner wants to work too then then often enough you you get a visa and then you find a job as a as a i don't know a secretary or something like that so so really doing some uh satisfying technical work together as a pair repeatedly it, it's it's quite it's quite outstanding i think um yes yes i mean again with with the with the background that we had um both of us worked on the auto hall project in in western australia um which again it was a good complex critical type project also for the organization at that time um and when that project sort of came to not a conclusion but it was r running in in pilot lines is when we sort of moved away and my husband was then, you know, he moved away to another project. I was on another project. But then when the opportunity sort of came about to moving to the U.S., the 
the organization had recognized the efforts from both both of us, the, the our strengths and our weaknesses. And I sort of put us in a place where I say, okay, yeah, we know you guys can perform here. We do need your help. And, and that's actually played, it played a major role um, from a job satisfaction perspective as well, because I knew I could go in there. I knew I'm, I'm there not as just a support mechanism. I'm there to, to deliver. I can sort of uh, fulfill my own um, needs in, in a way because I, I was just I've just moved from a project manager to a senior project manager. So I was gaining more experience, more responsibilities. So a lot of that uh, pavement of path was sort of done by the organization for me. And that was good. I mean, I can't I can't fault that in any way, shape or form. Yeah. So before I forget it, how, how did you get to Italy for work from home? I mean, your employer obviously has a big signaling headquarter in, in Italy, so that maybe it was related to that. That would have been my guess. But um, but but then again, coming from the US and instead of going back to Australia, going to Italy during COVID, it, it all it all seems very complicated. So how did this come about? So um, we went back actually for a marriage. So we went for my my uh, sister in law's wedding um, in in Italy, and the situation we hadn't seen them for well, the 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 in laws for three years, three four years due to due to COVID and the whole law and movement to the US. So. In a way, that was, um, and you you technically go back to your home country. So that was my husband's home country. Um, so you could go there and apply for a renewal visa. Um, so that's where we went to. And 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 yeah, you're right. <laughs> the 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 part of being a headquarter kind of helped because um, we were working in the same time zone as the the managers. That kind of sort of bridged a little bit of the gap as well because we could still sort of provide the, the feedback into the management, um, the senior management that was in, in Italy um, while, you know, while America was asleep in, in, a, in a way, yes. But but that means you weren't in Genoa, you were somewhere else in Italy. We were in Naples, yes. We ah, Naples. ah, okay. So so you, you weren't, during, it was really work from home. It wasn't work from uh, the company's headquarters. It was really work from home which just happened to be in the same country that, okay, okay, that makes sense. And and I mean, obviously, uh, yeah. Italy, Italy makes a lot of more sense if you have family there and then if actually your partner comes from Italy, then it, it's not really a strange country. Yeah? So so I, I thought that um, both of you would have links to Australia and then you were in the US and then all of a sudden Italy comes up and thought, oh, how did this happen? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so and and I suppose the work time as well that was quite important uh, because the the timing of work we would work we were working at three p.m. Um, Italian time to about two a.m. Um, Italian time so that was not one of the norm I'd say um, you know and you you you'd have to work from home to sort of support that sort of project time um, yeah yeah not yeah. that you know sort of had it. yeah. So, so that means you, you basically you match, you still match the normal office hours in the US, but just doing it from Europe. So you basically had, oh my God, it's American West Coast. So you probably had like nine hour time difference or something like that. Yeah, it was uh, it was challenging. Uh, um, it was very challenging. We were we were obviously living in the in laws place, and you know having two kids working from home stay almost most i'm going to say most times we were in the same meetings dialing in from two laptops close proximity um different opinions across the table as always because I, I was always played as a project manager i'm a project manager on most projects and all projects that i was involved in yeah. and he's the project engineer so i don't know in my history project managers project engineers don't get along so <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. Well, that that wasn't really my that wasn't my experience. I I can't I can't quite match that. I it, when whenever I was busy as a project manager, I I quite appreciated the work that project engineers did, and uh, so I, I yeah. considered I considered them basically as um, 
Yeah, I wouldn't say junior project managers, but but they were definitely related to the task of project management, uh, but more in a in a hands-on role, like like um, keeping keeping the wheel spinning, as I as I tend to call it. Yeah. So and and yeah. uh, but but I I I I rarely had situations where there was a big um, a clash in opinions be- between myself and the and the project engineers. But it it obviously depends on the project and the situation and probably a bit on the characters as well. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was it was a lot of different things. Yeah. So we you know one is the character uh, again. Um, from a from a technical perspective, there, there are a lot of technicalities around the project, and project managers often don't always understand um, where you know what decisions are being made, why they're being made, and just getting that understanding going, I think it's important. Um, and again, our opinions never it, you you always have a clashing opinions, and I think that's good. Um, but to embrace that in a manner that you can bring the project forward, so that it's good that you have different opinions um, and. It, you have that with your cost controllers, your project planners. You have that with, with everyone. Uh, but just how do you move forward from the situation that you're at? And I think that was sort of, again, it doesn't help when you're working from home, sitting in like, you know, sort of just different, different rooms, still can hear each other. And yeah, that, that was definitely challenging. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The moment, the moment there's a rolling pin on the table, it, it gets kind of dangerous for one person. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So um, eventually you did come back to Australia. So apparently Italy wasn't uh, attractive enough for you to stay long term. Um, So again, you managed to both come back to Australia at the same time and find a new project here. I'm, I'm still so impressed by this common journey of the two of you. Uh, from project to project to project. So, so how did return to Australia go? Um, so, return to Australia was interesting because I came back within the organization, Italy, uh, America, and uh, my husband was still supporting the American project. So, from his perspective, he'd come back here. I, I did the same, but for a shorter period of time. So, I needed that for a month, um, and I went back on my um, Australian project that uh, that I was working working for. Um, and yeah, so eventually, we both left the organization that we were we were in. Um, but that again, there are many complications that around around the, the around that decision but yeah so the move back was smooth in a way because we were coming back home we had a lot of friends ex-colleagues colleagues that we were working with um and or have worked with so things coming back was not too much of an issue um i i think in a way it just felt natural um you were you, you just felt like you haven't seen these guys for five years and all of a sudden you are reunited that's what. That's how actually it felt like, um, and it was good. It was so refreshing that you know, and it gives a good sense because I felt that I've made an impact here. Obviously, um, a lot of the guys remembered what I did as a as a project manager, as a person. Even I think you know that that's really more important. Um, and coming back, having realized, you know, people really have you uh, sort of get you with open arms and make you feel like, hey, you know, it's good. It's refreshing in, in a way, you know. So that was for me. I mean, I come, coming back to Australia was just very natural, very smooth. Yeah. If you were to compare the work culture, the project culture in the U.S., uh, and in Australia, what would be your impression? Did you find it very similar or did you notice any significant differences, like more general differences? I mean, especially since you've done more than just one project in, in the US, so so you, you have at least some perspective and not just a single snapshot of one specific project situation. Now, the first big one for me was um, there were a lot of 
subcontracts that they were all mini subcontracts that they were put in place and i don't know whether that was just a contract sort of uh, decision organization decision but everything was subcontracted out and that was something that was very uh, different uh, for me because majority of the work that we've done here in, in Australia, a lot of the design works were in-house. Yeah, we do subcontract stuff out, but was specifically to a subject matter for an element that you know you can't perform in-house. So, but that wasn't the case in the US. Um, a lot of the the jobs that potentially could be performed in-house was subcontracted out, and due to maybe it was due to resource constraints or whatever it, it could have been at that time. Um, so that dealing with multiple subcontracts and just pulling them together. I think that was, for me, was one of the challenge, I'd say, biggest challenge that I've seen. But from a culture perspective, I found within the work environment, um, personnel here, I mean, you, you would give an assign, you could give a task to someone within the organization, within the project team, and you would do above and beyond um, what, you are assigned to do um it's it was slightly different in in the us i felt like everyone sort of stayed in their box um so if i was a signaling designer i would just be talking about signaling i will not go into comms i'm not going to talk about oc i'm going to stay in my in my box sort of and you know i understand and that's not it's not right or wrong around that that's it's perfectly okay but I wasn't used to that. I was used to working with people that were sort of, we would wear multiple hats. You would just jump in and do things that were necessary. And I found that was my first biggest thing that I had to sort of overcome. It was a bit of, you know, it could also be the fact that it was the project environment, the project phase that I was in. So I felt that within the first project. On the second project, I felt it was, was almost similar where people really, worked within the bounds of the role um so and well that's actually a good thing in a way you respect your accountability your responsibility um and the whole lot it was still different to what i was used to uh where here you know i i and again also the project that i'm working on right now um, you have a if you have a task you assign to someone and if the guy can't do it you'll just say oh I'll still give it a go and that was sort of different in the US yeah mm. 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 okay um, as a project manager just just changing topics slightly as a project manager you you will obviously know about the famous project management triangle of uh, cost time and quality and uh, you will be responsible for those aspects as well now uh, a major topic in this podcast that keeps coming back is uh, looking at, at big projects and especially the problems that they often have with uh, sticking to the budget, ticking, uh, sticking to the timeline, to the schedule, and um, unfortunately often having blowouts in both areas. Uh, last year was notorious. We had a few very uh, prominent cases here in Australia where major projects were, um, were analyzed, were scrutinized, uh, underwent reviews or audits, and uh, they basically came back and said, well, not just that the, the cost estimate has gone through the roof, um, we, can't, we, we, we don't even dare to rely on it. Yeah? So we don't really know where we stand with this estimate, so it's all more or less guesswork at the moment. So, so, so things where you look at with a project management background and you think, how on earth could that happen? So, coming coming back to you, without commenting so much on on those on those projects and what may have gone right or wrong, um, in in a constructive effort to look at this attempt, what do you do normally to do your best to keep your projects on time and on schedule? And and also, what do you do when you feel that something's going slightly off the rails? How do you get them back on track? Now, it's it's obviously you know it's a it's a big issue. It's a it's an issue of all projects that I've I've been on, um, and I think one thing that have worked um, constantly, 
And I think that's just a factor. And that's probably why I kind of go back to that same mechanism every single time um, that I'm, I'm in, a, in a situation, um, is to have a key. So the schedule is good. The schedule is created, you know, during the, the first, as soon as the contract is awarded, you baseline it. Yes, we, we sometimes it really stakes. Sometimes it's, okay, yeah, I just need to meet the end date. Let's just squeeze everything in and just try to make it happen. Um, and But what does eventually happens is some one slip and starts with design. Yeah, design slips, construction slips, commissioning gets the last chunk of the pie at the end. And it's like, oh, I'm going to have to do this in three months now opposed to a year. And that's a Essentially, what always happens, all the projects, um, um, and the the biggest element there is just trying to understand what is stopping each step of the way. So, if you are in the design process and the design is supposed to finish in six months and it went on to eight months, why? What are the key elements that are stopping it? Can we move on? Can we still take risk and proceed? Uh, yeah, it's a risk. It's a risk to the organization. That could be, it will be cost uh, associated with that. But what are the event possibilities of that cost being sort of, you know, is it 80% on risk that you're going to perform a task that is going to change due to the, the lack of design or the, the uncertainty of design? Or is it just a pure, um, you know, efforts of getting everything in at the same time? So this is, there's so many different things that have come in play um, in in the years that I've been on on in this job. Yeah. So for me is if you have a task, yeah, you're gonna slip. You're gonna slip by a month too. Um, but understand why that slip is happening. Understand the critical factors that are stopping you to move forward. Nip that. Nip that. This there. And if you can't get that across. The, the project level team escalate to project management. You still can't get resolution, extend it to stakeholders, bring everybody in the room rather than sort of sending emails out. And I think that's actually helped tremendously in all projects because everyone wants the project to sort of go ahead. Well, I just find that sometimes, most times it's the case of communication where, you know, stakeholders don't either understand each other or they don't understand what's being said or what's being written. And just bringing people together has really, really helped a lot. Yes, I can imagine. Yeah, misunderstandings and and confusion about the situation, about certain things. That's yeah, that, that that's not that's not very helpful. Yeah, that's not very helpful. It, it builds barriers and having a a clear and proper communication where everybody understands each other, understands what the problem is, and and maybe even understands their own role, how to bring things forward, how to help resolving things. That's that's certainly very, very helpful. Yeah, good tip. Um, I want to touch on the topic of women in rail. Um, I mean, I've, I've had many examples, not, not so much on this podcast here, but um, I've, I've seen uh, examples elsewhere in the industry where um, women in the industry almost seem to wear like a badge. Um, I'm disadvantaged, I'm treated badly, I'm earning less than my, than my male counterparts and so on. You didn't strike me as a person who would have this kind of problems. I mean, it may be completely wrong. So, so what is, what's your experience as a woman in a mostly male dominated industry? And uh, did you find it difficult at times or do you, do you find your way around? Do you just have the, the secret source where you say, no, well, wherever I come, I get along with people well, and, and that's, that's all good. Um, a few things to that. So when I when I first joined the industry, um, I joined as a graduate engineer, um, and my first task was uh, within the com communications engineering role. Um, and I, I, with that first two years, I think was good for my career um, in the, in the engineering space because it sort of build the resistance. You understand what are you working with. Who you're working with, you build the relationships. And I think that was key. That was key to understand 
you know, yeah, people within the construction space, this is how they communicate. People within the commissioning phase, this is how they communicate. I mean, they do communicate differently. I'm, I'm not going to say they're all the same. They are different. Yeah. Um, and I think that for me was important because I joined as a design engineer. So I went through the whole process. I, I designed something, went on site, helped construct it, commission it, and then sort of saw that phases in, in you know, sort of, felt the different personalities and the challenges that you find. Yeah, of course. I was the only female in the, in the project team. It was different, uh, but not too far fetched because in, in my, in, in the university, I was alone too. So it wasn't that I was all, I was kind of used to the fact that not a lot of female does electrical electronics engineering. Um, you you tend to have you tend to get sort of working in that environment in my in my personal experience but then looking back now this is looking back in the last 15 got 15 years things has changed quite significantly I there's a lot more female in the space right now in the railway space yes pay I, I won't argue yeah um, pay is generally slightly less than male counterparts. Um, I don't understand why, and I I can't crack the code. Uh, so there must be some code going on, but I can't crack that. Um, but, I, you know, personally, I think personality is important to work within this space, but I would say that within any construction space, you need a different type of personality to work within that realm. Um, and it is not for everyone, sure. Um, but I have, there's a positivity around that space right now within you know, a lot of females joining the group. A lot of females are working in a leadership role, which is very different. We never had females in leadership role when I joined the industry. So, that is refreshing. That gives hope for younger women that can say, oh, hey, you know, I see another uh, a role model there. I would want to be the person who's sitting in there in that project or, or doing what she's doing. So that that is important too, I think. So that we've come a long way. We do have a bit more to go or a lot more to go, but I think we're on the right path. Yeah, I think confidence and self-esteem are very important topics. I mean, I, I definitely wouldn't want to uh, pretend that there there weren't cases of uh, of gender discrimination in the industry, as as sad as it is. But um, you can you can focus on looking for those cases, and you will find them left, right, and center. Or you can focus on doing a jo good job and getting along with the people in your environment and then this is more likely to happen so um so you, you can you can basically be the victim and then your chances are you will get victimized or you you just realize that there are differences that may even work in your in your favor um and and then you you work with with what you've got and i i when when I was in a situation where I could f help forming my project team that I was responsible for, I quite made a point in having some female component in the team because normally the rest of the team just behaves better. That that's one of the things. Yeah. So the the amount of swear words reduces and uh, and, mm -hmm. and 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 people just seem to yeah well display better manners if you if you will and um so and and that's and that's just one observation uh i i also value the the different perspectives that males and females bring into the job and uh, it can complement quite well and if you if you play with it if you play with that strength and, and i think as a woman in the industry you can uh you can emphasize that strength you can say well Yes, I'm. I'm kind of different. I'm. I'm not different in that I work in the same industry and I'm a project manager and 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 this and that and I'm basically doing the same stuff as the other project managers for the other disciplines. But on on the same side as as a as a woman, I am 
by by nature almost different. I've got a few a few aspects that I can bring to the table that that maybe uh, a man in the same role would do different. And and this kind of difference, this kind of diversity, is actually quite helpful or can be quite helpful to the project. And and then you basically convince everybody with uh, with results, as you did when you went to Boston on that project and improved things. So so and and I agree with you. I I hope that um, careers like yours and also discussions like we have now um, give some 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 hope and some confidence to to younger women joining the industry or the next generation of of women joining the industry. Because we need them, we simply need them. We, we've got so much of a resource problem in the industry, and and uh, basically discarding more than half of the population by simply saying, "No, no, we we can only go for for men in in those jobs." That would be a more plain stupidity, in my view. So that was my my little rant for for gender diversity on on projects. Um, you you mentioned there were a few examples in your career where you were pretty much the the only woman in a in a male dominated environment at university later in your in your first project and so on um more recently you seem to seek more for a community of women i'm thinking of women in technology so that that you know where i'm going with this um to me that sounds one of several like one of several initiatives where where women in the industry or women in technical professions kind of come together, form a network, create some strengths, help each other. I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm mistaken there, but I'm hoping I'm on the right path. But, but tell us a little bit about this uh, women in technology thing, whether that's specifically to Western Australia, whether that's a national thing or an international thing, and uh, what, what's happening there. So for me, I think the Women in Technology Initiative, it's, it's, um, it's was based out of more on a science uh, teaching type of roles um, is when I think it was first created. Um, but within the WA space, there, there's still work that needs to be done for women in technology in the railway space um, because they are different. Um, again, so not simplifying it, not excluding ours and say we are special, it is a very different sort of beast. And it is quite unknown. Like I've known for personally for me to have a conversation with other uh, women in, in the tech um, sort of space. And you are, it is it is quite far-fetched in a way, shape or form. You know, when, when someone talks about women in technology, they think about, well, you're going to work with space, you're going to work with, um signs you're gonna you know you know do different things and even even my conversation i had a, a couple of years ago i had a um a conversation with women in in technology in the columbia space station and it was the same thing i was one of the there were four women of four panels um the other three were all in the medical type space and the only one there was on the railway space was was me and that was not not like closely remote it, even related, you feel like you are, you know, you're not really sort of contributing to the to that space of technology, whilst you actually are. So I think, from a from a women in technology perspective within WA space, there are there is it's a huge, hugely beneficial um, sort of organization. They they bring women together that have contributed to science, to teaching, to um, to to all sort of different. Uh, so cybersecurity. So they bring all these guys together and they, the oh, girls together and sort of cherish their achievements. And that is amazing. That is really, really good because it helps um, women sort of one recognize another, you know, what's going on in that space sort of helps us grow. But I, I really do believe we do need one. I, I don't want to say one just for railway, maybe one for transportation. I don't know. Because that would be slightly, and maybe transportation, not on the civil space, because there is one too. But there is one women in um, construction, but it's specifically for construction. So you either, you know, you're, you're almost in a niche type of position when you are in railway 
because my my background is predominantly software you know rollouts de deployment of of signaling projects and yeah they are they are tech but not as tech as you would go for you know developing softwares and, and do all that sort of stuff in in the space of medical or cybersecurity and all that stuff but you're not too far fetched either but you're not not too too into construction as well so you are sort of in between and you kind of got forgotten i i think personally that was for me um and women in tech that in within the wa space they have created this whole um very very strong organization actually and i i think you know it's it's a good opportunity for any any women um to sort of follow them um and just see what they are there's a lot of initiative out there there's a lot of trainings courses out there that they do um and it's it's helpful it's really really helpful hmm yeah uh maybe you after after the interview can give me i don't know a website or something like that that i can put in the show notes that if anybody is interested or if it's if it's easy enough um for people to listen to it and and you can basically say what the best way is to contact them and to become part of that movement if you are uh, a woman working in the technology space specifically in railway so that you're not no longer the only one there um, is that something you want to talk about now, or do we want to do this uh, off offline? You give me a web address that I put in the show notes. Yeah, I'll give you the web address. Um, yeah, and and you can put in the note because I, they are they are on LinkedIn. Um, that's how I got introduced to them. To be honest, um, there's a lot of fellow uh, railway personnel that were following that group, and they started popping up more and more on my on my feed, and. And yeah, voila, that's, that was, I was then, you know, you don't know, you don't know, I was just following them that point on. So yeah, yeah. It, it's the amazing, amazing work. Yeah. I'll just, uh, probably after this, this chat, I'll put past the, the web note for them. Yeah. 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 Do that, please. Um, if. If I'm not mistaken, I've seen a post from you a while ago that you were somehow nominated for an award in women technology. So, so tell me about that. What what happened there? Yeah, so that was a good good coincidence. Uh, I I just come back um, to to WA and um, uh, uh, my ex project manager that was working for had nominated me um actually yeah had nominated me into this this uh this uh award and it was for again women in technology um it was for the um achievements that i've got in the last ten years um within the project management space um and how i contributed to the to the um contributed to the industry and yeah it was it was especially pretty good so the fact that i think it's open for every single woman within the space to be to have that opportunity to be nominated i think that's absolutely amazing um and i was fortunate because i had peers that obviously recognized the work that i did and thought that i should be nominated um and that was Again, for me, it was a pretty good space to be in. Um, yeah, but I, I went to the award ceremony that night. and But the amount of achievements, the amount of you know, the stuff that I saw you know, with, with other women in the, in the industry, in, not within the real industry, within the tech um, space, you know, they are really speechless i mean i i i was blown away i was like oh man i mean maybe i should do something else maybe i should do something you know i can come out there and maybe i want to be a space scientist that that was the guy because i was sitting with with the girls that were doing working in space i'm like wow you know like this is amazing <laughs> um so that was you know my takeaway but um yeah so that women in technology thing sort of came in the time that i think i needed it most um like all all of us, we we have our down times, and I think that was one of my down time. Um, so when that came around, it was really one that boosted my confidence. It's like, listen, take a step back, see what you've done, see what you've achieved, 
And yeah, this could be just be a low moment now, but it's not going to last forever. So that was one for me to look back at and say, okay, listen, Sony, things are going to get better. They're not going to always stay this way. So. I think it's something that uh, David Goggins, I'm not sure whether you know him from, from social media, calls the cookie jar, that uh, you, you basically have like a jar full of cookies and whenever you feel down, you just grab into the cookie jar. And instead of uh, taking something out to stuff your, your face with, you, you take a memory out of something that you have previously achieved mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that can help to, to get you through certain dips and saying, hey, I've, I've had bigger challenges than this before and I came through successfully and, and so on. So that, that's certainly a good idea. And, and yes, of course, if something comes uh, from the outside as an external trigger or an external confirmation, that always helps. And something that can be uh, like a word of, of uh, appraisal from the manager. Sometimes it can be something like this award nomination. And, and then it becomes almost secondary whether, whether you win it or not. But it, at least you've been recognized for the stuff that you've done. And, and apparently that must have been something positive. Otherwise, uh, nobody would have mentioned it. Yeah. yeah. And I felt that the, the, the journey, like after the nomination, was another one that I felt was quite personal to me because I felt people were, one, congratulating me, one was reaching out and say, you know, the people that you've, you probably haven't spoken to for the last, I know, what, 10 years. Um, and the message, the, 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 the memory they have of you, that, that's what you leave behind at the end of the day. And I think it's important as a project manager to be, To, to have empathy, just just look around you. There, there are going to be people. They're going to come into the project. They all leave something, you know, every single day, coming to work, to work within the project space or whatever. They all go through a different phase of their life. Just to under, just feel for them. Just you need to have that personality within a project manager. And I think that's really important rather than saying, okay, here, that's my deadline, do it. And I felt the people that came and sort of, Uh, reached out to me post nomination uh, was quite personal, quite sweet, and sort of left really a good memory in in me. I mean, yeah, winning, losing, mm -hmm. it doesn't didn't really matter. To, to that point, really, you're right. It was more like I haven't spoken to these guys for 10 years, and th that's what they had to say about me. That's so sweet, and that was that was it. Yes. Yes, yes. And, and I mean, there's, there's the saying, what goes around comes around. Uh, I mean, each of us can probably contribute to making the workplace a better place by, by actively uh, yeah, praising other people, like making them con uh, compliments, acknowledging the, the achievements that, that they have done and, and so on. And, and then uh, chances are that people consider you a nice person and they, they may... Uh, reciprocate that yeah so if you if you don't do it in order to get something back but if you're just doing it because you think it's a positive way and it it, it uh lifts up the energy of the place then uh, yeah definitely something something worth doing yeah and uh and it's a great networking opportunity as well obviously if, if it's important for someone and you would assume that it's important for someone and basically acknowledging this or um Uh, it's funny, we, we've just had um, elections here for the, uh, for the IRSE council. And, um, and I, I looked at the candidates and, and I, I made my mind up who I wanted to vote for. And then I, I checked them out in LinkedIn and I realized I was connected with them already for years, but um, never had an opportunity for a direct contact. I mean, sometimes it happens. You get contact by people in the same industry. You have a lot of common connections and then you just connect, but you don't really spend the time to build the relationship because you're too busy with other things. So I just got in touch with them and said, hey, I just voted for you and it's great that you volunteer for this stuff because it's a lot of uh, voluntary work. You don't get paid for that. And uh, and if, if people weren't willing to do uh, positions like this, then probably the entire organization would collapse, which is not good. So um, and and there yeah, and then they came back and basically appreciated the nice words and and the vote and everything. So so it it helped. Things like this just help building 
networks. And in the same way, it helps if you uh, appreciate or acknowledge what other people have done and, and uh, yeah, just, just be nice, not just having nice thoughts, but if you open your mouth, tell them, yeah. That's that's certainly I mean, yeah. certainly good. Uh, Sonny, we're almost up here with our time. Any parting words? Any um, one big tip for an aspiring woman in the ray industry who wants to get into the technical project management space? Anything that comes to mind? Um, not really, other than, you know, it's an if you get an opportunity, if, even though the work seems difficult, and that's often the case, um, where, you know, you, you get assigned to a task and it, it kind of looked daunting, um, very hard-headed players, just stand your ground. Just stay there, get in there, because at the end of the day, you're obviously there because you can contribute. So don't shy away and move away because you wouldn't be there if you were not worthy. So that's for me. I mean, if you're there, you obviously need it. You obviously appreciate it. Go, even though sometimes you don't really get that every single time of, of you know, of, of your workspace that people say, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, we appreciate what you do. But just get in there, do your best. There is no right or wrong in project management. Like I always say, there's just different ways of managing, just like your household, just different way of managing it, different opinions. There's no right or wrong. It can go either way. Um, but, you know, give your best effort. And if things are going sideways, make sure you escalate, make sure you get help. Um, don't shy away from getting help from anyone. That's okay. If you messed up, that's perfectly normal. Um, but, you know, sort of put your hand up and say, I need help. That's okay. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Perfect, perfect final words. And, and you're right. I mean, even... Even if you think you're not contributing that much, the mere fact that you're showing up and doing something would be better than you walking away and nobody doing anything for for that certain role or position. And and the and the person that put you in there normally did this on purpose as well. So that means that that somebody thinks you can do a good contribution there, and then you just yeah, you just need to do it, believe in yourself, and then yeah, dig your way into it. Sonny, thank you so much. Uh, I, I think that um, listeners can take a lot from this episode, not only when they are, if they are female and uh, work in the project management space. Um, thanks for the, for the courage to, to be on the, on the show and contribute. And all the best for your further career. And I, I cross my fingers that the, the further career trajectories of you and your partner uh, keep being synchronized. I think that's probably the best thing that you can wish for a relationship. Yeah, 100%. Thank you so much for having me. And um, again, this is a good opportunity also for me sort of just to, you know, again, it reflects, um, help me reflect what I've done so far, where am I here for? And uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Sonny. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hi, this is Doc Frank. I need to tell you about my brand new cutting edge 2024 training, Digital Signaling Interoperability. Interoperability is such a huge issue, not just here in Australia, but in other countries as well. Everywhere where you've got different railway authorities with cross traffic between each other. This course has the latest insights, the latest research. This training includes the SPA framework, systems, products, and applications, which creates a lot of clarity and avoids confusion in that area. We then look at the different technologies for digital signaling in Australia. And this is just an example that is transferable to many, many other countries in the world. We then give detailed introductions to the main technologies used in Australia, which are CBTC, ETCS, and ATMS. Then we discuss the hierarchy of interoperability controls, the different ways how interoperability can be handled and addressed. 
a special session on CBTC interoperability between CBTC products from different suppliers. Then we look at ETCS interoperability. And if you think that comes automatic just by using ETCS, you need to think again. This lesson will address how interoperability in practice can be achieved with ETCS, and it does require some work. And then lastly, interoperability between different technologies. What is required to do that, to achieve that? Which options are available and what is arguably the best? You can get access to this fantastic brand new training under docfranktraining.podia.com slash interoperability. I repeat that again, docfranktraining.podia.com slash interoperability. If this is a topic of concern for you and your Reve organization, then don't miss this training. Hi, it's Doc Frank again. I hope you liked today's episode. I like to keep it as simple as possible, so I only have one single request for you. If you like this podcast, please tell your friends and colleagues about it. That's all I want because that's a service that I'm providing to the industry. And I would like as many people as possible to listen to this podcast and learn something from it. So please share. And until next time, keep it simple and bye for now. Thank you for listening.